Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are honored to have Representative Chapman join us today and potentially Representative Theringer, we'll see. And uh, we, we are going to get started here. I wanted to ask everybody to put themselves on mute. And if you have a question, raise your hand or uh, go ahead and put your question in the chat if you'd like to get in the queue. Um, and then, and we like this to be fairly interactive. So if that's all right with you, Representative Chapman, who's been with us numerous times presenting. And so we are uh, about midway in the legislative session and there's a lot of different topics that are being considered in Olympia. And uh, we wanna make sure that Representative Chapman has an opportunity to share with us what is going on, but also that um, we talk about the North Olympic Legislative Alliance policy issues. The, and uh, so we'll be going over that with him as well. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you especially to Representative Chapman for say, taking some time out of your day today to join us and talk with us. Representative Chapman. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks Colleen for the invite. Thanks everyone for, for being here. And yeah, we uh, definitely, I'd like to hear more from you than you hear from me as far as your specific questions. I do want to touch maybe just super quick, and I see some questions already coming in. I do want to touch uh, just maybe on kind of the news of the day, which was the, the rollout of the draft transportation package, which for the first time was is already, you know, the chair of the House Transportation Committee, uh, Jake Fye, who actually grew up in Port Angeles and is a Port Angeles High School graduate, but represents Tacoma, and uh, Senator Leas from Muckleteal, they kind of negotiated um, a package together. So they're probably, as far as the two chairs go, they've kind of landed on where they want to land. Obviously, the big news, you know, no, no gas tax, no surprise in an election year, probably in the middle of a pandemic, gas tax probably was not going to be something that folks were going to support anyway. But what that meant was a limited number of bonds can be sold because usually you have to have new tax revenue. So that means not a lot of new projects. So I would say that this is a, a transportation package heavy on uh, preservation and repair, um, some modernization of our ferry fleet, certainly as we move to more electrified uh, ferries, four new electric ferries, will be funded and changing ferries over to hybrid. Obviously a huge investment in ferry infrastructure and, and training, as many of you, anybody who's traveled maybe over the last six months, the ferries have not always run on, run on time uh, due to lack of workforce. So we're putting a huge, uh, fairly large number uh, into the workforce. I, you know, there was, we do get, uh, we did get approval for um, up to $30 million right now for the SQUIM to Blinn corridor project which I know the city of Squim has been uh, very, you know, working hard with the Jamestown tribe to try to make that corridor a little safer, run a little smoother. So that's, you know, when I say there's no new projects, that's considered a, a really a safety corridor project. So it's not new pavement, it's improving the pavement. And, and they're still going through the design phase. So I know everybody wants to know exactly, you know, what's gonna happen, are we gonna have roundabouts? Well, they're still working through that, but I suspect we do seem to be a state that's moving more and more toward roundabouts as a way to keep goods and services and people moving. So I do think you probably need to expect that to see some roundabouts through that area. Um, other than that, there's, you know, it, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely moving. Um, there's some, there's, there's money in there for, uh, increased um, grants for transit as they begin to move to try to electrify the transit system around the state. There'll be grants for Clallam Transit that they'll be eligible for. Um, and I think the, the last thing is there's, you know, there's been a lot of talk about public infrastructure dollars from the federal government. The, and there are dollars, but they, uh, we have to remind folks those are competitive and you have to kind of have the project shovel ready. So that's why right now we're not projecting a lot of dollars from the feds, but we think that as DOT moves forward, 
there'll be dollars that they can, as projects are moving forward, they can apply to the feds, get the money, and then that'll stretch the, the state money. It's, it's, it's called a 16 year, $16 billion transportation package. Um, but really, you know, as all things, because there's no bonding or, you know, there's a little bit of a bonding because we had some excess capacity, really a future legislature can revamp this. Um, I do, you know, it, it continues to move toward the goal of only electric vehicles being sold in Washington by 2030. So that's a, that's a priority. Uh, and that seems to be something that society wants to move forward. Um, should the state mandate it? I think that'll be, you know, the debate. I don't think, you know, it doesn't mandate it right now, but I think there are those in the state who want to mandate. The Alexa, only stop. Just um, a moment, I'm sorry. Go. So I think that'll be something to watch, but definitely, you know, you know, 50, I've seen anywhere from 45 to 55% of our carbon emissions as a state come from our transportation system. So certainly a, more electrification of our entire transportation system. There's not a lot of specifics yet. And actually some of the specifics have been embargoed until they've been released to the press. And I, I expect more details to come out later today. We'll probably vote on it this week. It, uh, unfortunately, uh, normally transportation budget is bipartisan. Um, and normally the house passes their package in a bipartisan manner because the house only negotiated with itself and then the Senate would do their package and then they would concur. And I think this time because the house and the Senate kind of negotiated the two chairs to go negotiated together. And you know, unfortunately, I think this, uh, this is, looks like it might be a partisan vote but it looks like the Republicans have some serious concerns with this package. That's always disappointing to hear and in a short session it, you know, we'll see, maybe, maybe there'll be a few, but part of the concern, and uh, you know, I think this is legitimate, part of the concern is there's not a lot of new pavement, especially in rural communities, there's not a lot of new projects to ease um, some of the congestion, and, and, and so rural, rural Washington won't get a lot of the money, and I think that's probably where some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have con some concerns. I put in for a couple of budget requests for Grace Harbor and didn't get them funded. So the only thing, the only request that got funded from my request, and I'm in the majority party, was the Squim to Blinn uh, corridor, but the Grace Harbor projects I put in for were not funded. And I haven't seen yet, I can't find yet of the Jefferson County projects that I think Senator Vandaway worked on. I'm not sure if they were funded. So really kind of limited funding. Um, Enough on that. I do want to touch base. We're going to get probably into a ton of questions, but I do want to just, the nurse staffing bill seems to have a lot of folks concerned. I see uh, Jennifer's maybe on the call from Olympic Medical Center. I have been meeting with hospitals. I just want to be upfront and honest. If this bill passes, you're going to, you know, according to the hospitals, you're going to have less access to healthcare at the hospital level if the nurse staffing bill passes. I just was on a call before this in Grace Harbor. Um, telling them this, they have the same kind of group in Grace Harbor, telling them basically the same thing for Grace Harbor Community Hospital and Summit Pacific. Um, we live in a, you know, right now nurses, you know, people are concerned with their workload and, and, and there's a lot of concern, but I don't think there's any way a bill like that could pass in its current form. Now, maybe it'll be amended, maybe it'll change, but in its current form, I think that the hospitals are correct. And I just want the public to, all, my only point in all of this is that we pass bills and usually we have debate over, you know, what the bill does itself. So the, if the debate was only whether or not nurses, there should be more nurses and they should have more staff help, you know, they should uh, larger numbers of nurses taking care of fewer. I don't think anybody would, would agree with that. I think the disagreement would be if the, if what happened, what do the hospitals have to do if they can't find the nurses and meeting with the realtors yesterday. I mean, even if you, nurses wanted to come here and work, they may not find housing. So I, I think, you know, as long as the public is aware that we want to, you know, I think the average person wants to support nurses and wants to keep them safe and thanks them for their service. And I, but I also want, you know, the public needs to realize there may be, now our hospitals do a great job and they may figure this out. They may, the, the, the cuts to services may not be as great, but I do think that the public, this is one where the public, and you know, the more the public weighs in definitely would make my job easier because I'm not interested in cutting access to healthcare, but I'm also not interested in having our nurses, you know, over 
Well, they, anyway, I'm not qualified to talk about how nurses feel, quite frankly. What I've heard from are the union leaders. So I know how the union leaders portray how nurses feel. Um, I do live next to two nurses, but they work night shift and I very rarely see them. But so I'll just mm -hmm. stop there and maybe just try to, as questions are pouring in, the more I talk. So I probably should stop. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm gonna ask the first question. Uh, we've done a lot of work on Highway 112 and there's five locations on Highway 112 and one on Highway 13 that really need uh, repairs so that the population way at the Northwest end of our county ha can access the rest of the world. Um, and Steve Rourke, the Olympic region administrator did say this is a, the, a unique location within our state that is isolated in this way. But he also said when we met with him that their intent is just to use emergency funding because that is federal funding and they don't have money to create a long-term solution for those people. Um, and so we talked to him about the ARPA funding that was coming through that would be available over the next five years. But even to go after that, you need to have an, an amount that it would cost and an estimate. And he doesn't have an amount or an estimate of what it would cost to relocate part of the road to a more geologically stable area. And from what I understand, talking to the county staff, it would be less than a million dollars to determine what it would cost to uh, relocate everything and come up with an estimate to repair these six locations that would ensure that there's um, consistent uh, access to people in CQ, Quallum Bay and uh, Nia Bay. Is it now too late to get that funding to create an engineering estimate in this year's transportation budget or you know, a capital budget or anything like that? So good question. Uh, there's three troubled areas in the 24th and, and it's been a frustration of mine that we just, we don't do a good job of having a fund set up for uh, repairs of roads that slide away. And so it's usually done on the emergency basis. I don't know if DOT is planning what they're planning they can usually do some planning ahead of time. There's no money in the, but in the, like I said, there's no, there's no money to move the road. But there's also a road that feeds the Quinault Indian Nation that's also sliding away and they want that road moved and there's some maybe some emergency repair. So we do more on emergency repairs than we do actually move roads and there's no there's certainly no investment in moving roads in the in the current transportation budget. So he's right. It, it operates on an emergency basis. Um, could the state apply for federal dollars? Uh, maybe, but they'd have to have some match money and they don't have the match money for a new road through there. And, 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 and there's just not, like I said, this isn't a package that puts a lot of money in for new roads. Okay, yeah, thank you. So he said it would be tens of millions to, to yeah, fix. Yeah, unfortunately we have, a, like I said, there's three areas that we're, we've, we're losing roads and, and people are having to take detours um, because of where we live and for the foreseeable future. I mean, we'll try to get that. I think they're trying to get that road open on an emergency basis, but yeah, it's a difficult, and uh, somewhat of a failure for those of us who serve on the, for those of us in the rural areas who serve on the transportation committee, it's been a failure to, to get those funds in the budget. I'll, I'll take responsibility for that one. Well, hopefully next year we can get at least funding to do the engineering and the geotechnical work to ensure that we know what it'll cost going forward and we can eat, hopefully, uh, at least try to get some money for that. So that portion of our county won't be so isolated. The, the best plan of attack would be to work with DOT and, 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 make, and have it be an agency request legislation that makes the governor's yeah. budget, um, but they have not been in a position. And without a new gas tax of which dollars could be bonded, it, it makes it difficult. But yeah, that's, that's been a frustration. And, and I've, you know, I, take, I take full responsibility for the inaction on on those roads and for budgeting for the future of the roads in our district, so. Okay, well, I will let uh, TJ Green, the Macaw tribal chair know that. Well, he knows, we've budget. talked. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, uh, so Jim Stoffer, you had the first question up, go ahead. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you, Representative Chapman. So Senate Bill 5017, it's out of Senate, but it, and it's over in Representative Derringer's uh, committee right now, but I know it would be crossing you also, but it's uh, about clarifying school district procurement requirements, um, construction management, uh, construction review, building commissioning. Um, all of these speak to uh, rural economy jobs, um, prevailing wage type things. So um, just your overall thoughts. I think that's this is a very good venue to have that because we're all um, kind of in that same hat out here. Um, I will be jumping over to a, a meeting in the Senate, but uh, that's why I wanted to get this off the bat. So thank you for being here. Oh uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting. You look at that bill that passed 47 to nothing off the Senate floor last year, came to the House, made it through committee, went to rules, didn't pass last year, and then it went back to the Senate this year. This year, and I don't know what was a, I'm not sure what happened, but the Senate then became a partisan vote of 28-20. And so now it's in Steve's, in Steve's capital budget. Um, I haven't looked at that bill enough to have an opinion. Just makes, something's gone wrong where you go from 47 to nothing to 2820. So I'm not sure what, what has gone wrong. It is a, has bipartisan legislation, legislators, but I'll have to take a look at that. But I assume that if it comes out of Capitol and comes to the House floor, I'd probably vote for it, sounds like. Okay, thanks. Uh, Karen Rogers, you have a question? Good morning. Thank you, Representative Chapman, for being here. I'm going to um, also note that my dear friend and colleague, Jim Hagwood, asked the similar question. Our concern is with the law enforcement bills that were passed last session, the impact to our communities has been felt. The rise of crime is now daily, broad daylight, and it's harming our communities. And if you look at this from a safety standpoint and a community development standpoint, what is the legislature going to do to restore proper police and sheriff law enforcement laws so we can protect our community? And number one, I, I, I am well aware of the problems of the people that are living um, on our streets and they need treatment. I'm not here to debate that, but they need treatment. And without treatment, the crime is increasing. So what's the legislature gonna do for their responsibility of the laws that were passed? Thank you. So tr tricky issue, an issue that I've, uh, so I was the only Democrat in the house who voted against the reform packages last year. I probably received more criticism for my no vote than I ever received, thanks. So. Definitely, I was not in lockstep with my party on that. Um, we did pass one small reform that clarifies law enforcement's use of force when dealing with mental health. Um, and Wendy, I think, has been here and explained some of the struggles with behavioral health and law enforcement and some of the interactions that they had this last year that where it wasn't clear. Um, all I can say is I think that might, you know, I think there's a maybe a, there was another little, there's a, maybe a couple of other small amendments, but, but the, the, I think the House and the Senate and the legislature is going to kind of stick with the reforms that are in place. Uh, many people come from districts where law enforcement may not have the same respect that it has on the North Olympic Peninsula. And yeah, this is, this is one where I'm clearly out of step both you know, from local Democrats and state Democrats. Um, but I think the North Olympic Peninsula, I've said this many times, I'll continue to say it. I think they have some of the finest men and women in law enforcement. And I think this is a district that still generally wants to support law enforcement, but not everyone agrees with that. And I've heard from my constituents, many, many constituents feel policing is still uh, too draconian in its approach. I don't agree, but I have to respect that many people in the community continue to wanna see further reforms so this is a, a debate um, and I don't know at this point as a society, I don't know what the answers are. I, I think Chief Smith and Port Angeles, Chief Crane, Sheriff Benedict, you know, I think they've done a masterful job of navigating this, working, giving me their opinion, weighing in, being accredited agencies, you know, all the things that we would ask of a modern police force. But I think there's many legislators who still believe that the police are not reined in enough and have too much authority. And I think that we may not see any further reforms this year, but I would expect we'd see <coughs> more reforms next year that maybe some of us wouldn't agree with. But this is a tricky one because generally my party is not happy with police and, and a lot of folks in the party 
wanted to see more, you know, uh, there, there's no way you can win on this issue. Let's be honest, politically, there's no way. Uh, but, so I, I don't have an answer, Karen. Uh, I've been dealing with this for the last year and a half. I don't have an answer. Um, I'm not sure I've, what I did was right in voting no, because it took away my ability to maybe amend bills, offer amendments. Uh, so you kind of lose when you, once you're a no vote, you're kind of lose your ability to influence legislation. Um, this is a tricky one. And this is one really maybe where community is gonna have to weigh in again and, and say, this is not what we want, but many districts still have a very, anim you know, they really don't trust their police. And that's really sad as a former law enforcement officer for myself. But I don't think that feeling pervades on the peninsula. And I'm gonna stick with that even when I get, I'll get lots of, you know, this well, I per in the district I, that disagree. I personally thank you for your vote and the stand that you did take. And it would seem that some communities, we should have a little more flexibility to deal with our problems as they, as they are. But crime is increasing tremendously here. And um, just let us know what you need. I, you know, I think you're right. The communities, and when the community statistics come out, it's going to be hard for the legislature to ignore those numbers. So thank you again. Okay, next up, thank you, Karen. Next up, we'll uh, have Michael Smith and then Chair Allen. Michael? Okay, not hearing Michael. Uh, Chair Allen. Oops, okay. I'll let Mike go. Okay, go ahead, Michael. Hi, finally got myself unmuted. Sorry about that. So Washington Cares um, Act um, kind of scared some long-term care carriers out of the state. Uh, people who were trying to buy long-term care coverage to get the exemption from it were prohibited from doing so because the carriers wouldn't sell policies anymore. And um, now that it's been delayed 18 months, I don't know if anything's being done to get those carriers back into the state to offer private long-term care insurance. But as an employer of several people over the age of 65 who would not have benefited at all for this tax coming out of their paychecks, um, I advocate for them. You know, they're seniors, they're close to retirement. Some of them are working past the normal retirement age for our society. And Washington Cares would not have helped them one bit and would have in fact taken money away that they needed for their monthly budget. So, and it provides a benefit that's less advantageous. It takes three ADLs, you'd need th help with three um, activities of daily living to trigger a claim, whereas private LTC only requires two ADLs to trigger a claim. So I, I personally think it should be repealed entirely and if not repealed, what fixes are being done to enable the private market to still operate? And for people who are in my employee situation where they're 65 or they're within five years or, of retirement and they're just not gonna get a benefit. A uh, good question. We did, a, we did a delay the implementation of that tax. You know, there's no move afoot to repeal the bill. I think the reforms that may come out of the delayed implementation would give people closer to retirement, the ability to opt out, um, military, people who live in Oregon and work in Washington. But remember, for everybody who opts out, that means the tax that will have to be collected to pay for the fund will increase. So we'll end up with, with a higher fee for the people who are participating. So that's my, that's, you know, these programs don't come cheap and they're very expensive. And this is the only state, we're the only state in the nation that's put something like this in place. So I don't think anybody know, has any clue what the actual costs are gonna be. But as we let more people opt out, which I believe will be part of the reform package, it'll just mean a higher fee that inevitably will have to be collected for those of us who still work in the state. Um, you know, the actuarial would show that long-term it would save the state money because it's very expensive right now when the state has to help pay for these services. But at the end of the day, the, the there's a cap, a lifetime cap and, and may not be as robust as I think some people thought. So I think, I think the debate will, I think there'll be, I think this program will, you know, the debate will be whether to repeal it or to make it more robust. Right now, the direction would be to make it more robust, collect a higher tax down the road and make the program even more, um, more robust, but that'll be decided down the road by a future, next year's Representative, 
sorry, Representative Chapman, I, uh, Representative Theringer is also on. So I wanted to give him an opportunity to chime in if he wanted to. Um, I know he's been on that committee. And then uh, we'll move to Chair Allen. Thanks, Colleen, and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, Michael, to your first question, we don't have any control over the private market. They, they dropped out because they thought a lot of folks were gaming the system, would sign up and then drop off. As you know, in the private market, there's a lot of review of any existing conditions. There's a sexual bias. There's, you know, gender. They have different rates for gender. You don't have any control over the premiums. The premiums increase by, you know, whatever the private insurer wants to do. Those are all different from what the Walk Cares program will do. It's a set rate that you pay only when you're working. You don't pay once you're retired. And it does, you know, allow you to stay in your home. Uh, and as Mike said, right, we've it's on pause for 18 months to address the near termers. Those are those folks that wouldn't, you know, not vest in the in 10 years. So people that were, you know, 64, 65 that are retiring, and we'll address that. We did pass a bill this session uh, that does eliminate out of state and uh, military spouses. Uh, the military, active military don't, from originally didn't have to participate in the program. So uh, I think as Mike mentioned, this is the first in the country. This is a structured savings account for folks. And as you know, most people have about 50% of the people only have about $25,000 in savings when they retire. And that becomes a huge obligation on the state and on us as taxpayers through Medicaid. And you, either, Medicare does not cover long-term care as a lot of people think it does. And Medicaid, to be accessed to Medicaid, even for those two, um, you know, for those uh, assistance in daily living, you have to spend down all your equity to be able to be eligible. So this is a program that you're gonna see a number of other states, you know, adopt, we just, you know, right out of the gates, we had to make some adjustments. And so we've got 18 months to do that. Okay, thank you, uh, Representative Theringer. Chair Allen. Uh, thanks, Colleen. Um, and uh, good to see you, Steve and Mike. Uh, uh, I just do want, I just want to do a shout out to both of you and Kevin. Uh, I know you're working hard on this uh, short session, trying to get as much done as you can. Um, first of all, uh, um, Mike talked before you got on, Steve, uh, about nursing. Uh, and I just want to remind both of you that uh, the Peninsula College has established a new nursing program that, you know, that we uh, provide some uh, pretty serious resources to help that program uh, to enhance the nursing, the, um, new, new young nurses entering into the industry uh, to help our cause out here in the Peninsula. So if there are things you can do to help the Peninsula College program, <clears throat> for <clears throat> developing uh, new nurses, um, um, we would certainly appreciate that. And I know the, the college would too. Um, on the, uh, a couple of other issues. Uh, first of all, I wanna say kudos to you on the bypass uh, from uh, Palo Alto to uh, Cinders. Um, I know we're talking about, you know, the different options um, and we can sort that stuff out later. More importantly, I just want to want to say thank you for making that happen. Um, the growth and development uh, up in Palo Alto and, and Happy Valley is increasing dramatically. And uh, that traffic is a huge uh, uh, concern uh, to say the obvious to both of you. Uh, so thank you and, and uh, nice work. And we look forward to working with uh, county and the, and the city on, on that project because uh, it definitely affects our properties and our, our activities. I want to shift to natural resource stuff, um, and um, you know, yes, yeah, uh, uh, we did. We did put the Lorraine Loomis a repairing zone um, on pause. Uh, Mike, we agree with you and Kevin. You're concerned about the ag industry. I've met with some of them, um, and I've said that okay, uh, we agree that we need to have roundtable conversations. Repairing zone is necessary, guys. Um, you know, we can't the no net loss concept can't continue because we get into the bottom is not an acceptable place for us to be. So we have to have a net gain approach on, on repairing and, and, and environmental protective measures. 
and and growth has to take responsibility for it. So I'm okay, Mike, uh, um, in pausing it, and I I, I encourage uh, both of you uh, and Kevin uh, to engage in this conversation about solutions. So um, um, the, uh, the devil's in the details, and and I know that it was uh, probably too it probably moved too fast for this short session. So we're okay with that agenda. But there are other measures out there. So I, I want to point out um, that the um, 1117, um, I know it come out of the house. And so I'm counting on you guys to talk to Kevin about this issue. Kevin emailed me, texted me, I'm sorry. Um, he's mad because his uh, 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 banning of gill nets and, and trying to direct the fishery industry on how, they, how we should be catching salmon, the non-Indian side. Um, which is a great concern to the tribes. I, I just tell you that there's stuff that he doesn't know about the industry and, and he's, he's causing some problems with his proposal. Yes, it's dead. But now his comment to me is because he didn't get his bill that he's not gonna support 1117. 1117 creates a lot of money, it's in the obvious to you two, for the counties and the cities to deal with Growth Management Act while you're taking responsibility for, for um, um, the uh, 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 better balance and net increase to the environment. And we need 1117. Because we didn't get one and we didn't get another, then quid pro quo doesn't, it's not acceptable for us. I can tell you that from the tribal perspective. But we put pause on, on a big bill that, that is, is basically deferring something that has to happen. And, uh, and we'll work that out in the longer session. So I just want to say that to you guys. Um, we need you to and Kevin be on the same page. Um, for It's not just a tribal issue, guys. This is, a, this is a statewide issue. And so 1117 really does need to get passed so we can move forward. Growth Management Act needs to be updated. It is out of date, um, to say the obvious. So um, I just want to raise that issue with you guys. and, and uh, Whatever we can do to help, um, uh, uh, we'll do. Uh, we'll, we'll do our part. So, and then you know that we're doing it in Jamestown in the, in the Scrum Dungeon Nest Valley. Um, and we will definitely work re very responsibly uh, with the ag industry as well as the others affected by 1117. So, thanks a lot for both of you guys. I appreciate those comments, Ron. 1117, for, for the folks who don't know, would, would promote salmon recovery through revisions to the state's comprehensive planning framework. And it did pass the House. Steve and I voted for it. It, it does languish in the Senate. Uh, and I'll, I, Senator Vandeway, I'll talk to him, but he probably does. I can see where he would oppose that bill. Um, Ron is right. We had the, the governor's Lorraine Loomis Salmon Recovery Act that landed in my committee this year. And um, Ron's right. It, it, just because it, that bill didn't move forward in a short session and it was, it was probably too comprehensive and hadn't been, you know, stakeholders felt they hadn't been, uh, been a uh, consult, you know, uh, collaborated with enough. But I don't, you know, nobody, nobody, everybody agrees that more work needs to be done. But, uh, you know, the salmon recovery and the fate of our salmon, uh, like Ron said, is at a perilous point. And I think the ag community, like the, like the timber community 20 years ago, who stepped up and provided buffers, I think that the buffers for the ag community is, there's, you know, there's going to have to be some work there. Um, I will say that Representative Lakana, Ron, is kind of taking the lead. She's the only Native American woman in the legislature and she's kind of taking the lead um and you know the inevitability is there'll be a new chair of that committee next year so that that you know i suspect that it'll be representative lakana so i think that there'll be a different maybe a different approach on how that how legislation like that is looked at but i'm not happy that it died and i didn't personally kill it I, my position all along was that folks but honestly ron it, you know you had some concerns and i you know i i you know, we pulled back, but, you know, I'm not happy. I think that we missed an opportunity, but in a short session, we just ran out of time. And then uh, through some other dynamics, just, it's, you know, a new chair will take a new approach on things and that that can open things up. But um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we didn't get there. And I think, I think it's, a, I think it was a missed opportunity 
and, and, and I've taken full, I actually take full responsibility for that building that dying, I was the chair and, and we just couldn't, couldn't get to where we needed to go. So there's no, there's nobody else in the state. It, that bill had one hearing and it was in the committee that I chaired and the bill didn't come out of committee. So the chair takes full responsibility for that. Um, and, and, a, and a, you know, it's kind of a colossal failure the way, the way we operated in that committee from the hearing on forward. So, um, you know, you, you learn and, and I'd never been a chair before and it's a difficult position, but I take responsibility. And I always, you know, look, you, you, you can't blame anybody if you're the chair of a committee and a bill that should have come out didn't, you know, and it was, um, sorry, Ron, I, I do feel bad, I, you know, we- Yeah, and Ron, <laughs> let, me, let me say, um... You know, we've had conversations with the governor and I've had conversations with the Recreation Conservation Office and um, uh, Commerce. We have, you know, a number of programs and I know this buffer issue was brought up at the Centennial Accord meeting this year. And I know it is important to the tribes. We're looking at program, existing programs and existing project lists. Right now, the number looks like about 140 million in projects. Uh, that we're going to try to highlight within our capital budget to expedite those projects and get them moving that are that are riparian focused, if you will. I don't know what the final number will be, um, you know, but that's kind of the strategy right now to move forward to do this work without having to have that legislation. Um, and on your other issue around, uh, obviously, staffing, uh, nurses staffing is a big issue. I see Jennifer's joined the call. Uh, as you may remember, we put, I don't know, about 600,000, maybe a little bit more into that program originally at uh, Peninsula College and both uh, Olympic Medical Center and Jefferson Healthcare stepped up. And I think even Bill Littlejohn, before he passed, uh, you know, provided money for a couple of, um, you, know, um, you know, scholarships for that program. And last year, what we did is we increased the salaries of instructors, because as you know, um, well, probably you know, Jennifer certainly knows, the traveling nurses who are kind of these, uh, just as it says, they kind of move around from hospital to hospital, they're making, you know, 200 bucks an hour. So it's pretty, so to get a good instructor who wants to be in a community college class as opposed to be traveling around making pretty good dough, uh, we had to be competitive. Uh, we're not at those numbers, but we did increase those salaries to increase the, um, you know, the number of instructors in the other issue. And there's been conversations with OMC and Jefferson Health and, and the North Olympic Health Organization to provide placements for the practicums and, you know, the, the practice for these nurses as they finish their program. So we're trying to improve that pipeline as much as we can and in making investments into that pipeline. Well, right. we appreciate that, Steve. Uh, uh, with, as you well know, our, our healing clinic uh, is adding 70 new um, staff people and, and a significant number of them are nurses. Um, and um, so I, it's a big deal to us. Uh, we, we made a serious commitment to that program as well. Um, so we appreciate it. It's on your radar. That, uh, uh, and, and, and I just want to circle back to you, Mike. Um, I don't blame you. I think you did it. You're doing a great job. I know your commitment and, and Steve's as well. And uh, I'm just saying we we got to we got to move the needle. Um, and uh, and so there's a number of components to it. And so that when I say we put it on pause and, and we'll we'll fix it correctly. The bill moved too fast on the Lorraine Loomis Act. And uh, so there was some problems in it and there was unnecessary penalties, uh, inappropriate penalties, if you will for non-compliance and so forth. So, um, but the 1117 um, not only does good thing for the environment, but it helps the counties and cities. I wanna underscore it. And that Kevin's gotta remember that. His, his job is also to represent the counties and, and the cities as well. And we want them to have money to be able to deal with growth management responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Allen. Um, next up, we're gonna have Stephen has a question and then Hans. Stephen? I see you're unmuted, so go ahead. Okay, let's move on to Hans. Okay, I don't know if um, you've uh, seen my question in the chat, so I'll just read it out here. Um, it's regarding electrician training. 
Senate Bill 5599 uh, attempts to fix 2018 Senate Bill 6126, which was the apprenticeship mandate. Uh, but it isn't sufficient to pr protect rural electrician jobs and businesses and their customers. At, at this moment, we're seeing huge increases in demand for electrification work like EV charging stations, electric heat pumps, solar and batteries, et cetera. Our growth is only limited by our ability to train new electricians, which was made much more difficult with the passing of 2018 Senate Bill 6126. The apprenticeship mandate takes effect next year, and we're already feeling the impacts with electrician trainees quitting and moving away from the peninsula. What can be done this session to delay the mandate until it can be fixed for rural and small business? So Hans, um, did you track, and I meant to try to get a copy of it to you, of the Saldana bill, Senator Saldana's bill that I think came out of, or maybe on the floor now in the Senate, where they made some adjustments. It's, it's focused on apprenticeships for electricians and they made some language changes there. I have not had a chance to study it to see if that addresses your issue or not. It doesn't, that's a 5599 that I referenced in my question. Um, it's, uh, it's been uh, heavily, basically it, um, it fixes some things for the union and CITC apprenticeship programs. It does nothing for us. So what I would suggest, and I don't know if it's still on the floor or in rules in the Senate, get in touch with uh, Peter Steelquist in Kevin's office and get him that language. I've been communicating with them. Uh, to be honest, just been super busy and haven't been able to follow up, but um, that's one opportunity to try to amend this and get your language in. I think the best, as we've talked about, probably the best strategy is to extend this for a couple years so that you get more time to to figure out a way to move forward. Um, yeah, uh, we've been in touch with Senator Vandaway and, and, and Peter, and we've been working with them, but the best they've been able to get uh, is a, um, a working group to study, or they actually uh, added some language to task L and I uh, with coming up with solutions. Um, and I, I'm not confident in L and I at all to do that. Um, so, so really uh, the, the efforts to delay the mandate have been pushed back hard by uh, the union and CITC um, who are uh, mainly concerned with, with um, getting their apprenticeship programs rolling in the urban areas. Uh, we've been forgotten and they're they're not interested in helping us out. So, and I'd like to add that I got information from L and I about, so there's uh, trainees that are working to become, um, you know, journeyman electrician, electricians. There's 132 in total in Clallam County, 66 in Jefferson County. There are of those 132 in Clallam County, 10 are uh, full apprenticeship, uh, union apprenticeship uh, trainees. And I don't believe any in Jefferson County because there are no Jefferson County union electric, electrical contractors, correct? So, you know, you're talking about a lot of people that are going to have to commute to Puyallup. It, there's just lack of accessibility. No, uh, yeah, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem. There's no question about it. It's a problem. Um, they, re, they refuse to consider virtual distance learning. Uh, they're, they're just being completely inflexible. They want to push through the apprenticeship as a one size fits all, and they're not. I've sat in on apprenticeship council meetings. They are really unreceptive to any of our needs. Um, I mean, we could take a run at it in the house because obviously it has to come to the house. Um, the problem is, is you're in, we need to have action. Sometimes, you know, having things not happen is, is a good strategy. But in this case, you need to have something happen. Otherwise, it kicks in next year, right? Correct. And, yeah. So um, if and I'll try to check back with Kevin and see what the politics are in the Senate and see why they haven't been able to maybe try to hang the amendment on the floor and, and get a better shot at it. Um, so um, when was the last time you communicated with them, with Peter or Kevin? I believe it was last week. Okay. I've been heavily involved with this over the last month. Yeah, no, I really appreciate your, your thoughtfulness on this. And these are you, what, you're, what you're requesting is um, 
seems very reasonable to me. It's just um, just the politics of this right now, I think, which is too bad. All yeah. right, thank you. Um, so next up is Steven. He's got his microphone working again. I think, Steven. There we go, hello, yes. Can yes. you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I had to restart my browser. Okay, um, so it, the, you know, we're talking about homelessness and, and the lack of uh, housing across the state. And I'm, you know, watching with great interest uh, the millions of dollars that are being allocated to sort of put band-aids across uh, the issue. And I've, I've brought to the legislature several times now the issue that's created at the policy level in, in transient accommodations that allows for unregulated vacation rentals or short-term transient accommodations if they are under three rental units, so single-family homes, apartments and apartment buildings and so on, they are unregulated as short-term accommodations. So if I own those properties, and there are lots of people who buy these kinds of properties, it, they can put them into long-term housing, which means they're regulated by landlord law, or they can turn them into short-term accommodations and they're completely unregulated. And so why wouldn't they just put them into short-term accommodations since the state doesn't regulate them at all? And the legislature could close that loophole by simply revising the short-term accommodations law to apply to all short-term accommodations instead of having what used to be the granny exemption, which was I'm going to you know rent out a room in my attic, which is very much not the purpose of the, the law. And now we've got thousands of housing units that are shifted out of long-term housing. Airbnb is actively promoting now these sort of medium term rentals that are unregulated that can be you know rented out for months at a time again it's not putting it back into long term housing it's driving up housing costs we've got thousands of units that are uh, in this situation uh, because they're unregulated and and i don't understand why the legislature won't take a common sense common sense approach to just close this loophole You want that one, Mike? Um, so we usually defer to local jurisdictions. Port Townsend, I think, has that restriction. I think Port Angeles, I don't know where Port Angeles is on that, but usually those are you know, local jurisdictions, decisions. We try to shy away from prescriptive measures around those sorts of things at the state sure. level. That's not to say we don't step in sometimes, and there are some bills out there that are dealing with zoning uh we talked about the it's, it's, it, but it's it's DNA. not a zoning issue sorry it's not a zoning issue and cities and counties can't say hey we're going to randomly apply a state law that doesn't apply the state's created an exemption for these properties and you're putting it on every city and county in the state to go oh we're going to overrule the legislature on this issue and so they're spending thousands of hours arguing with each other simply because the legislature has created a loophole. Yeah, you have to show me the whack, I guess, with the bill and I'll take a look at it. Yeah, there's no bill. It's just the, the, the whack says that short term short term accommodations require a state license if they have three or more rental units. If they have two or one rental units, they're exempted from the law at the state level. So it's created this whole issue across the entire state as a result. Yeah, this is the first I've heard of it actually, so. Okay. Oh, well, okay. I think it's fair to say we could spend two hours debating why our housing crisis, and, and there's answers on all, there's multiple answers all over the place. And I, I don't think there's one solution that's the magic bullet. I also remind everybody and for the realtors in the room, I mean, it's, it look, Washington, it, it, Irregardless of all the issues that have been raised today, newsflash, Washington is an incredibly desirable place to come. And the North Olympic Peninsula is an incredible place for people to come. And people come from outside the area and buy houses at rates that for those of us who've lived here for a while are like, wow, who buy that house at that price? I mean, the pricing of housing is, for, and then people want to live here. So I know there's a lot of problems. And I think Steve and I will always take our share of responsibility. We haven't fixed every problem. But Washington still grows every year, and we have you know hundreds of thousands of, of lack of inventory, and I don't know that there's one answer 
for the housing crisis until you regulate a free market. I mean, we can we could go down that road and say, you know, we're only going to let houses go for a certain price. But man, that would be reordering our entire capitalistic system. So as long as people will move here from California and pay five, six, seven hundred thousand for homes on here in Port Angeles that I think are worth two fifty, who am I to say they can't? And, and we can't regulate that. And and I I, mean, I know people are afraid. You also can't force builders to build homes. Everybody wants well more more homes need to be built. Well. The builders can only build what they can build, and we don't. We lost a lot of builders during the Great Recession. So, I mean, y'all. Sometimes I wonder if people want to do away with the free market in housing and just have government dictate it. And I don't think that's the answer. I know I, I don't support that, but it is. We, for all our problems in Washington, we're still one of the better states that people want to move to, and the North Olympic Peninsula is one of the best places on earth. So we have some good things to think about. So again, I'm not I'm, I'm not saying it's a silver bullet. I'm just saying it's one of the, the issues that at a policy level, there's a discrepancy that was created years ago that has helped create this issue. And the legislature could very easily with with no not having to shift millions of dollars or anything, simply say, hey, this applies to everybody and not just some people. Yeah, and I think we're unwilling to step in and do that. Do we step in and like we put a lot of policies in place to, you know, landlord, you know, landlords who couldn't collect rent during the pandemic and, and there's a bill now to you'd have to give six months notice before you raise rent. But I think on some of these things, the legislatures mm -hmm. kind of said we're not going to weigh in. And part of it is the cities and counties don't want us to tell them what to do a lot of times. No, you know, I, I don't know you guys, but. Send the, right. whack, send the whack to me and we'll take a look at it. Um, I, like I said, I'm unaware of the issue of that whether it was this. Okay, okay. Uh, next we'll move on to Priya. Priya? Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Hi, Go ahead. Representative Chapman, Representative Theringer. First of all, let me just say thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us when um, it's a short session and super busy for you. Um, I just wanted to focus your attention. There's a lot of bills moving through right now, um, which focus on the intellectual and developmental disability community. And I hope you're, um, you're aware that those bills can make a huge difference. But there's one thing in particular that, that um, stands out right now, DDA, Developmental Disabilities Administration, does not caseload forecast. It's one of the few agencies in the state that does not caseload forecast. And um, Senate Bill 5268 has in it that as a courtesy, uh, uh, forecast will be made by DDA. And I think that language needs to be changed, that it needs to be amended so that DDA is required to do caseload forecasting. Um, and as an example of the value of this, it, um, if you look at um, HCBS waivers that are administered through the um, Aging and Long-Term Services Administration, they rank number two in the nation in terms of HCBS, HCBS waiver administration. But DDA, which does not caseload forecast, um, also does. DDA does not caseload forecast, ranks 41st in the nation. That's a huge difference. And so instead of DDA always coming to the table and saying, hey, do you have some loose change left after you've already given money to all the other agencies? It would be very valuable for DDA to come in and say, this is what we need. This is the caseload that we have to support. Our no paid services caseload needs to decrease. We really need to serve individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities appropriately. Um, and having that as a must in DDA really is a game changer for the entire um, population of individuals who, who rely on those funds. So I hope you, you would be supportive of, um, of making that amendment um, in that that bill. So that's all my request is to you. And also, if you have any questions with regards to any of the others, 19, HB 1980, HB 2008, or any of the budget provisors that are moving through, please reach out. We would love to talk to you about um, what we need in terms of supporting those as well. Thanks. And could you send uh, Mike and I, or certainly send me an email with that information, that bill and that language change, that would be helpful. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, will do. As you could maybe deduce from this call, there's a lot of stuff going on, so. Yes, there is. <laughs> yeah. So true. Uh, okay, I see, um, I don't wanna skip anyone, and I know Kay had something in the chat. Uh, also, Chair Allen had a one more question question or comment. Kay or Chair Allen? 
Yeah, I just I'll just jump in real quick. <clears throat> Appreciate the squim to blend improvements and wondering if you can speak to uh, what's next in terms of a longer term plan for 101 in general. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, like I said at the start, uh, this is a transport. It's a 16 year transportation package, but it doesn't have a lot of new projects. So we were lucky to get the squim to blend corridor because it's one. It's the only one. It's the only new project in the district that I was able to get funding for. But as far as 101, I think what you see is what you get for the foreseeable future. Um, there's a there's some preservation dollars and some maintenance dollars, but there's not. This was not a package. Uh, with many, you know, it's a big package, but it is not, it is not pouring new pavement. And that really, I mean, truth be told, that's a, that's a priority of the House Democrat Transportation Committee and the House Democrats of no new pavement, maintain what we have and get people into mass transit, you know, let, let's expand mass transit, let's expand sound transit. There's many billions of dollars for the Vancouver to Portland light rail. So I do want people to know that the idea it's a it's a it's a it's a climate change centered transportation package for the next 16 years and it is where we were house democrats want to lead the state where the governor wants to lead the state um I, you know if i if i negotiated i might have negotiated a few more projects for my district but this is the priority this is clearly the priority it's a moving washington forward it's taking the many billions from the climate commitment act and and moving into electrification of our fleets from autos to transit to ferries. It's getting people out of their cars and into mass transit. It's moving to trails and bikeways. Now I'm not, remember this is a package for the whole state, but this is a state, This we had a briefing yesterday and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, this is a priority of our caucus, this kind of a package. I think people feel like this is the best transportation package the house has put forward. In, in a decade or in decades, if not ever. I think somebody even said this is the best for climate change and the impacts of climate change and, trans, um, and the transportation. This is the best package we've ever put forward. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a lot of focus on maintenance and, and you know maintaining infrastructure. Um, things could change as we get more clarity around the I, IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. Uh, that infrastructure bill that came out of DC in December. Um, but yeah, I think the focus is to more, uh, obviously th it's an important project at Simdar's there and Palo Alto. So we're uh, uh, getting that done is a big deal for us. Um, but I do think the focus is on maintenance more because just our infrastructure is in tough shape, right? Our road and transportation infrastructure and then investment it's investments in ferries, which is important to the peninsula, of course. So I, I think we have time for one last item and that uh, there was a question from Chair Allen, who I think has jumped off uh, about Mino Carbon, uh, the Jamestown and Herman Brothers project that is uh, to try to create a biochar plant in the Port Angeles area that would uh, produce about 10 megawatts of power and produce biochar out of residuals. And his question was, would there be any funding in the capital budget for that potentially? Correct. Yeah, no, I've talked with, I've talked with this, with my chart. This is an exciting option. Uh, Colleen, I know you've been in conversation. Ron, I did not know that you guys were kind of, uh, the tribe was partnering up. My understanding is they're not quite ready. Um, and my conversation with them, this is probably a biennial, next year's biennial budget for a couple of reasons. Uh, they'll have a more matured proposal and two, the, those budgets are more robust, obviously on the biennial cycle, so. Well, um, I, I, uh, yes and no. Uh, we're shaping it out now. Um, uh, Bill Herman has talked us into partnering up with him and, uh, and uh, Mino uh, Car Char Carbon. Um, we're submitting a pretty substantial uh, grant application for Department of Energy. Um, and the project will cost around hundred million dollars. It, it's a big deal. Um, and, uh, and so we think that uh, we have a good shot at it. Um, and it takes a while uh, to, to um, make this happen. I just say the obvious, Steve. So um, I just want to get it on your radar <clears throat> and hopefully the state will be able to contribute uh, 
uh, to this project, which is a, one of many, if it is as successful as we think it will be. Yeah, no, I think, but I, I think that, let me know if the, my timing, uh, I thought of the timing is different, but, you know, as folks may know, we were able to put some capital budget money into uh, uh, Pacific Northwest Labs in SQUIM at their SQUIM facility, which brought in a pretty robust Department of Energy investments. And I think that's going to be an ongoing uh, sort of uh, improvement there uh, and make that a real um, strong uh, economic factor in in SQUIM and East in on the North Peninsula. Uh, there's a lot of advantages using PNNL's uh, facility there and partnering with the Department of Energy. And we have also done, state has also done quite a few investments with the Department of Energy over in the Tri-Cities uh, on grid modernization and battery and electric storage, uh, both on the pure science side of it and for the application science of, uh, of those two areas, which of course is super important for you know, as we move to more electrical, just a more robust electrical grid. So um, there's some history there, Ron, and we're certainly not opposed to helping out uh, for something that's as exciting as this, as Mino and Biochar. Okay, well, that's exciting. Thank you, Representative Chapman and Representative Theringer for your time today. We really appreciate all the work you do on behalf of your constituents in the 24th district and particularly Clallam County. So uh, it is just after nine o'clock and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. We will have the full uh, discussion up on our website, chooseclallamfirst.com later today. So again, thank you so much and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Colleen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.